disappear. Good morning. Uh, so I don't know if Mary's going to stay in the room. I hope I hope she is. Um, it's a bit of a challenge for me that um, I'm always very distracted by wanting to know whether, what Mary thinks of what I'm doing. But I'll still try to look at the camera and engage with you. And um, when Mary was praying for clarity, I kind of, in my heart, also heard her pray for brevity. I, <laughs> Both clarity and brevity would be great, wouldn't they? We'll see how we get on. So live. Wow. Um, I did earlier on take a, a photograph of um, our makeshift live TV studio here. And I might put a photo on social media later. Um, I want to say thank you to a whole bunch of people in the team who have um, put this latest experiment together. Um, for any of you who find it a bit glitchy or there are odd things about it, um, please forgive us. Uh, the team is, uh, the platform might not be ideal. The team, we are all learning as we go along, but the work that's been put in by a small group of people is huge. And I'm very, very grateful for them. And please bear with us. And um, in a few weeks, we might really act like a, we might seem quite professional, which might be a bad thing. Um, I'm certainly not professional today. I have um, a set of props around me and um, already Mary's adjusting my movable TV <laughs> monitor because I've knocked it. I have a number of props around me, so um, hopefully I won't suffer from prop catastrophe as I bring those to your attention. Um, I'm, today I'm speaking about fellowship, and this is the third of a series um, I've been um, speaking on called Devoted Revis Revisited, where what I'm doing is looking at what Acts 2 tells us about the four things that the first church in Jerusalem devoted themselves to, in a period just after the Holy Spirit fell in a spectacular way on the day of Pentecost. And um, last time I spoke, I spoke about the devotion, their devotion to the apostles teaching. And I'm just working through the list of four. And today I'm going to speak about their devotion to fellowship. I want to look at what, what was fellowship? What was fellowship that they devoted themselves to? What did it mean to them? And what relevant relevance could that have to us today? Uh, before I really start, I want to do a shameless plug for my latest book called Reset Your Church Life. One or two of you have that already. Um, it's available on um, Amazon in the UK, also Amazon in Canada, Amazon in the United States and other parts of the world. Um, I, think, um, I think it's a pretty excellent book, but I'm quite biased. Um, but if you're at all in interested in some of the themes that come out of this series, Part of the book is about the whole subject of looking at what the Acts 2 church devoted themselves to. So uh, today's message is not a repeat of a section of the book, although some of the elements are in the book, um, but this is a, a message all on its own. I'm going to start by looking again at the key passage, starting at chapter 2, verse 42. Let's look at that together. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. And um, so, as I said before, I think the Bible doesn't tell us in so many words, this is how church everywhere should be all the time. But it looks like a pretty healthy church to me. And I think there are almost certainly important lessons we can learn from their example. So um, before I really get into trying to unpack what I think fellowship is all about, I want to maybe tan maybe it tantalizes you, maybe it doesn't. But I want to just dangle in front of you a little bit of information about something that happened once at the King Edward School in Birmingham. And... Um, I want to mention something that happened there. I hope the reasons for this will become clear later. I might forget, in which case maybe someone might post a comment or um, Mary might interview me about it later. We probably won't have time. But um, there were four students who set up a, uh, a group at that school called the Tea Club Barovian Society. 
And the three of those people were Jeffrey Smith, Robert Gilston, and Christopher Wiseman. And um, I'll come back to those, that group a little bit later, maybe, we'll see. Now, so I want to really get into um, what do we think fellowship really is? When we, when we read that these people, these first Christians devoted themselves to fellowship, what is fellowship? And I'm, I don't think I've said this previously when I've spoken on this series, but in the passage from Acts 2 that, 2 that we just read together, um, it starts with saying what the four things are that the church devoted themselves to. And then there's some description about what life was like in that church. And I can't prove this, but I think it's quite clear that the person who wrote that passage, they described, they, they listed four things that the church devoted themselves to. And then what we read immediately after that is simply a bit of a description of what life was like in that church. And so I don't, I don't think it's a, an exact question, an exact formula or a way that you can package things in little boxes very, very neatly. But I think it's fair to assume that at least to some degree, if the church devoted themselves to four things, and then we get a description, a little bit of what life was like in that church, maybe in the description, or I think certainly in the description, we might get some kind of indication or evidence of what it meant for the church to be devoted to those four things. So you can maybe look at this yourselves later on, but it's a bit of a bit of a quest, a bit of a discussion point for you. Is looking at the rest of that description in the passage we just read. What, if anything, in that description is there that is evidence of devotion to fellowship? What is fellowship? And um, so I'm going to start poking around with that question. And I have the first very important visual aid here. And I'm breaking all kinds of rules of TV. One of which is never eat on TV live tv i think that's a rule and my uh, my visual aid is a donut i'm afraid it's not a delicious homemade muffin by someone in the church but it's a donut and i'm not only showing you this donut, i'm actually going to eat not all of it but part of it which i shouldn't do mm, and it's a jam donut i can't risk the jam that probably sounds disgusting to you me eating i do apologize just one small mouthful now why why i hear you ask why am I eating a donut in a sermon about fellowship? And the thing is, we can all have ideas of what we think fellowship is. And I'm not criticising any of them at all. Please, please hear me. But um, I was eating a donut partly to illustrate that part of what we might think fellowship is, is we might connect the word fellowship, the idea of fellowship, with a kind of nice feeling we have, maybe in the days when we're actually able to meet in the same place at the same time and may those days come back soon lord but that time like after us after a, a church service when you can have some tea and coffee and there might be some cake and biscuits and you can see people you can hug people and the seeing people and hugging people is nice having the tea or the coffee or the muffin or the donut or the chocolate cake or the biscuit is also nice and I think to some degree, some of us can attach the, the idea of what fellowship is to that kind of nice time that we have at the end of a meeting. And I'm not knocking that. And the reason I had a donut and Mary might prod me, she's sitting <laughs> beside me at the moment. She might <laughs> prod me. But um, there is a, a particular network of churches called the Vineyard Network. And Mary and I find ourselves talking about the Vineyard Network from time to time. And we had the we had the privilege uh, many, many years ago of going to the the kind of mother mother church of the Vineyard Network. It's the Anaheim Vineyard just outside Los Angeles. And it's where a, a, a man he's with Jesus now, a very famous man called John Wimber, really um, set up his base. And um, we just we used to associate the Vineyard Network with a they used to have very good donuts. And I think may, maybe this was even before the service rather than after the service. And then when we started being around the whole Toronto scene, uh, you, you could you could have you could get donuts and other things there. I think 
things have moved on and people are a bit more healthy now and you maybe have the option of fruit or I don't know, maybe a piece of lettuce, I don't know. But uh, quite recently, and Mary's not kicking me yet, but quite recently, more than once, we found ourselves talking, Mary's wanted to talk about the Vineyard Network and she hasn't been able to remember the word vineyard. And she said, oh, um, that the donut network, those the donut churches, what are the donut churches? Are you in the vineyard, love? Oh yeah, that's right, the vineyard. So crumbs, I'm not criticizing tea and coffee and anything else before a service or after a service. I'm certainly not criticizing donuts. Later, I will finish off that donut. It's not just a visual aid, I'm having that donut as a little reward for myself after this. I'm not criticizing that, but I don't think that is the whole sum, the whole expression of what fellowship is that people devoting themselves to. Another way we use the word fellowship or people have used the word fellowship is it's kind of a, just another word for kind of church. So Gateway um, in its origins, Gateway, Gateway had the word fellowship in its name. It was Gateway Christian Fellowship. And uh, when Mary and I got married, uh, the, the, the church we were part of before Gateway in Barking East London, again, that was that was first called that was Barking Christian Fellowship. And I think quite a few churches in this country, at least in the UK, um, if they were new things and they were setting up, they often chose the word fellowship. I think it may be said something about them being new and different and not like old church. In fact, I've quite a few of those churches, including Gateway, now call themselves church. So things things go around in cycles. But um, what is what is fellowship really all about? So I've got another little picture to show you. Some of you will recognise this character. This is Chief Wiggum from uh, the Simpsons and um, he loved he loved his donuts or he loves his donuts and I was a bit shocked I checked out something about Chief Wiggum um, on Wikipedia and I found that he's a, obviously he's a fictional character this um, obese um, lazy basically incompetent policeman with a great love of donuts more, probably more in love with donuts than catching criminals and he has the same birthday as me. I was a bit upset to see that. It's not the same year, but 28th April, same birthday. Um, anyway, I probably digress. So um, what is what is fellowship really all about? So um, maybe a part, maybe it's true that even in church culture, fellowship is just an English word, but maybe in our experience of church, we've become so used to using the word fellowship in a certain way, that maybe we should park the English word for a moment and just look at, as, as part of understanding what fellowship meant to the first church in Acts 2, when it says they devote themselves to fellowship, what is the word and what does the what did that word mean to them? Because if we can work out what it meant to them, that should help us understand what it can mean to us. And it was a Greek word, koinonia, Koinonia, and it's really koinonia that is the heart of what I want to look at today. I want to unpack what is koinonia, what was koinonia to them when they devoted themselves to koinonia, and what can it mean to us? Now, and um, there are some some words in our New Testament which were not, they were kind of new words. So, for example, one of the words for love that is used in the New Testament, agape, that's a Greek word. The, the church kind of, they made up a new word. They were experiencing, it's like they were experiencing something new and they made up a, a new word to describe a new thing. But um, koinonia is not a word like that. It's not, it's not that the church was experiencing something wonderful that we now call fellowship and they didn't know what to call it. So they invented a word koinonia. Um, it was a perfectly well understood word by Greek people Greek speaking people at the time. And actually it's used quite a lot in our New Testament. So without wanting to speak, spend a long time on an intense Bible study, but I can give you references separately from this if you want to see them. I just want to run through some of the things that koinonia means when we actually read that word in our New Testament. I think that would be a good idea. Do you, Mary? Do you think that's a good idea? She's nodding, so I'm going to carry on. So I'm um, just looking at my notes, for example, in 1 John 1, John tells us that um, 
if we continue to live in spiritual darkness while we claim to have fellowship with God, while we claim to have koinonia with God, then we're lying. So we can't have koinonia, we can't have fellowship with God and continue to live in spiritual darkness. And he, he contrasts that with saying, if we live in the light, if we live in the light, then we have koinonia or fellowship with each other. So koinonia fellowship is something about deciding to live in the light and turning our backs on anything that's spiritual darkness. That's something to do with what koinonia or fellowship is. It's about being honest about sin issues and doing what we can to make a break with sin in our lives. Then uh, moving on in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul's talking about communion, the Lord's Supper. And he says the bread is our koinonia or fellowship in Christ's body. And the wine is our koinonia or fellowship in Christ's blood. So there, koinonia or fellowship is about sharing in the reality of Christ's sacrifice and the reality of his victory over sin and death. So I found that interesting. That, that seems to be saying something about what fellowship is. And then there are whole, it's not difficult if you do a study on the word koinonia in the New Testament, it's not difficult to find references to money. Uh, for example, in 2 Corinthians, Corinthians, Paul is organising an offering for part of the church family in one part of the world that's in great need. And he talks about how various churches in the known world have begged him to have an opportunity to share in making contributions to that offering, giving money to the offering. And when he talks about those churches begging him for the opportunity to participate, he says they are begging to have the opportunity to have fellowship in the offering, to have koinonia in the offering. Um, in the book of Romans, he talks about um, churches making a contribution to help the poor. And he said he actually says the contribution, the actual financial contribution is a koinonia. The actual contribution is a fellowship in the good work that's been done to the poor. So it seems to me that koinonia or fellowship is something to do with recognizing a need and helping even with our financial resources. And then the last little thing I want to look at is um, to do with fish. And um, in Luke chapter five, uh, we read a story about the miraculous catch of fish. Um, Jesus, P Peter is in the fishing business, Simon Peter, and um, Jesus has just used Peter's boat as a, mo as a floating preaching platform. So he's in the boat, just a little bit off the shore, and he's talking to the crowd. And then after that, there's more interaction between Jesus and Peter and some other people. And um, Peter experiences going out and experiencing a miraculous catch of fish. So many fish that he can't cope with hauling those fish in. So actually, there's another boat where he has partners. And he tells his partners in the other boat to come out and help me to land these fish. And um, the word used for his partners in the other boat is koinonis, which is basically the same word as koinonia or fellowship. So um, in that story, it seems that koinonia or fellowship is a bit like fishermen helping each other out or business partners helping each other out. I just have a picture there of, it's a slightly seasick inducing picture. If you can see the angle of the boat compared to the angle of the horizon. And uh, the person on deck is kind of pointing as he's giving an instruction. Um, so koinonia or fellowship is about working in partnership with each other. I've just got a picture here to try to summarize those things. So koinonia is in the middle and these other ways that that word is used in the New Testament, I think, give us a hint of flavour about um, what koinonia or fellowship really is about. So it's about light. It's about our 
colonial fellowship that we're devoted to, if we're devoted to it, is about our being serious about addressing issues of sin in our lives, being honest about issues of sin and turning away from darkness. It's about the body and blood of Jesus. It's about the fact that whatever it is that we have together as fellowship, it means nothing unless it's based in the reality of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Koinonia is about financial support. It's about, um, it's about our working together, being aware of people's needs and even being prepared to um, see that change the way we use our money as well as everything else. And Koinonia is about business partnership. Um, I've got another visual aid here. I'm not sure how easy this will be to see through the camera, but um, I'm trying, it's actually a brass plate and it says, be our Spencer, then it gives my um, degree at the end. Be our Spencer. This is a brass plate. And some of you will know, um, for a number of years, I was, for quite a lot of years, I was a solicitor. And for part of my career as a solicitor, I was actually a partner in a law firm. And when I became a partner, I actually had the brass plate produced and my name was stuck on the outside of the building along with the other partners. That was a sign that these are the people who run this business. And um, so I've got a little bit of experience of what partnership is like. But in that firm, you know, we had partners and people who were partners and people who weren't partners. I think the kingdom of God, I think the church is different from that. It's not that some people are partners and some people aren't. I think we can conclude that in Acts chapter two, when people were devoting themselves to fellowship, part of what was going on was that they all saw themselves as partners. They all saw themselves as partners. Um, I mentioned earlier on something that happened in a particular school in Birmingham some time ago. And um, I should, I am going to remember to explain what I was talking about there. Uh, the Tea Club Barovian Society, I, I, there were four founders of that society and I named three of them, Geoffrey Bash Smith, Robert Gilston and Christopher Wiseman. I deliberately failed to name the fourth member and the fourth member was J.R.R. Tolkien. And um, Tolkien wrote this, well, this is part one of the Lord of the Rings. We have a big three part um, presentation of the Lord of the Rings. This is book one, The Fellowship of the Ring. And it's generally accepted that for Tolkien, the fellowship the, in the story of the Lord of the Rings, the fellowship of the ring was partly inspired by the Tea Club Barovian Society that he set up with three friends at King Edward School in Birmingham. And I don't know if you know the story of the Lord of the Rings, but the, the fellowship of the ring was a group of nine people, including Frodo Baggins. Bilbo Baggins, I always get confused. Frodo. Frodo. Um, thank you, Mary. I always get confused. Nine people who were committed to the destruction of this awful ring at whatever cost. And for Tolkien, that was fellowship. And, you know, I'm, as I, as I said earlier, I don't mean to disrespect donuts. I don't mean to disrespect a, a nice feeling of support and comfort we might have when we're around people, when we share hugs, when we have conversations over tea and coffee, all of that stuff is good. But what I want to try to um, lay out for you today is that the fellowship that the Acts 2 Christians were devoted to was far more than a fuzzy feeling. However nice and valid the fuzzy feeling is, this was a commitment to something that really mattered. And when Tolkien said that his group in the Lord of the Rings was a fellowship, I think that says something very powerful and very relevant about what true koinonia or fellowship is. If we decide that, well, if it was good enough for the Acts 2 people to devote themselves to, I think we could devote themselves ourselves to fellowship as well. So if you think about somewhere like, you know, our family, our church family, the Gateway family, it's great experiencing fellowship, but our fellowship cannot be, is not based, it should not be based on anything as um, superficial as we've got background in common or interests in common. Um, 
our group actually is quite a diverse group and I think the diversity is fantastic. I think we should continue to celebrate the diversity and embrace more and more diversity. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that if we're thinking about the type, kind of fellowship that the Acts 2 church were devoted to, it's got to go way beyond anything that we have in common, apart from one very important thing. And that's the reality of what Jesus has done for us. That is way bigger, way more important than anything else. And it also means that we can even be together, have a sense of being together that overrides things that maybe we would see could separate us because of our different backgrounds, because of our different preferences, because of our different views about other things. We can have different views about things, provided we have a very, very similar close view or not a thing, but a person. And that's the person of Jesus and what he's done. And I believe that if we if we can embrace in a healthy way devotion to fellowship, that will continue to be very good for us for life, for our life as a church family. I've got another picture I want to show you. I want to kind of, kind of try and summarize what I think the focus should be of a church that is devoted to fellowship in a full biblical sense of it. And that's an image of um, it might be a father and daughter, might be an instructor and um, just a, a young person going on to a school. But it's to do someone. I think someone is showing someone else how to climb. And I believe that kind of picture is at the heart of what we, what we as church should be aiming to do. Um, Me too. Need to go down this one. Sorry, find it bear with here. me. Yeah. Bear with me, sorry. There, I'm back, I'm back. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mary. Um, that picture of the, the person learning to climb, that's at the heart of what I think we should be aiming to do. That what is our purpose as a church family? What is a healthy purpose for any church family? Well, I believe it's introducing people to Jesus, you know, evangelism, helping people to make the connection with Jesus for the first time, and then making disciples. And for ourselves, being prepared to be made disciples, because that's what Jesus told us to do. He told us to go and make disciples. And if that is important, then we will be committed to it, whatever the cost. You know, it won't be to do with my, my personal comfort, my personal preferences. It will be the cause, the purpose, the mission. So I hope that's helpful. Um, I'm going to hand back to Mary and, um, you know, she can either simply say goodbye or say something wise or ask me questions or look at your comments. But thank you for your time. It's been great to be with you. God bless you.